development of established MOOC G, which might explain the paradox of high dropout rates uh, according to the research and literature, um, uh, which contrasts somewhat with uh, the high number of enrollment figures. For example, more than 3 million people across the globe were in Coursera during March 2013. Recent research suggests that the problem of impersonality across online courses can affect levels of participation and interaction and therefore have an influence on learning. So, to alleviate this, is this issue, there is a need to focus on social presence. So, giving you some sort of background uh, in terms of the uh, literature particularly there, um, I wanted to uh, hone in on uh, Moodle and uh, its MOOC, specifically the MOOC that was uh, run by HQ. Okay, but before that, which was last September, the first ever Moodle MOOC was run in June 2013. And Martin Dugamas was a keynote speaker with Stephen Downs, Brian Alexander, and Dave Cormier were presenters. Um, this was run by Dr. Nanny Deutsch. There is now an established learning environment for MOOCs known as Moodle for Teachers on WizIQ for the webinars and Moodle for Teachers M4T website. And this is led by the Moodle MOOCs take place in February, June, and the fifth course starts on the 1st of October 2014. Has started, I should say. In essence, then, it therefore appeared timely to undertake research about Moodle in relation to such a large course as the MOOC. To be clear, this research study examined the teaching with Moodle MOOC Learn.Moodle, led by Moodle HQ, and that ran for uh, four weeks due to September, involved 193 countries, over 9,000 participants were enrolled, and 2,000 practice courses were logged. What was the purpose of the MOOC? Well, uh, to introduce participants to the basic concepts of Moodle, a central course structure with activities and resources, an opportunity to build own practice courses using the sandbox design, and to invite participants to engage as students. <clears throat> so this shows, um, this actually shows the participation engagement levels, and you'll notice that uh, the blue segment was the actual practice course completion. Uh, we looked at the forum posts and the Moodle sites. So there's lots of activity with practitioners uh, to and fro and across their own sites. There were some observers and there were incomplete practice courses. But essentially, the participants made progress um, with MOOC um, you know, drawing on their own choice of, uh, of direction, which was very important. Okay. So what were the headlines? Well, it certainly exceeded expectations on many levels. Um, and I now want to go through, um, briefly refer to the foundations of the Moodle course design inherent in Moodle's development. Okay, so uh, first we have the educational philosophical reference. As you can see, it's an eclectic mix, uh, constructivism, constructionism, social constructivism, connected and separate knowing, and so on. You can see it on the screen there. Um, Ultimately, then, it can be recognized that those four references draw on the notion of an application of knowledge in action. So, uh, Mr. Dugamas, um, when he designed Moodle, he designed it specifically with these philosophical references in mind, which is um, all of these together. 
um, are analogous with Dewey's philosophical stance, and that was back in the 1800s, uh, about learning. The need to consider environments, interaction, materials, resources, social setup, and learner dispositions, their capacity to learn, and, and, and how the teacher supports that. For clarity, then, these reference underpin Moodle and underpin the Moodle MOOC design, and therefore promote a relativist ontology, based on the assumption that different interpretations can exist about what it is to be. And this is in line with a constructivist epistemology, that knowledge is perceived to be constructed. So ontology is about what it is to be, or you know, how do we exist when we learn? And secondly, epistemology is about knowledge. What is it? What is knowledge? How do we perceive it to, to exist? Um, so my two points there, and I'll repeat them, because they're quite tricky concepts, that Moodle and the Moodle MOOC design are underpinned by a relativist ontology based on the assumption that different interpretations can exist about what it is to be, in line with a constructivist epistemology that knowledge is perceived to be constructed. And there's uh, some related um, links to the documents there. <clears throat> um, I just want to go back one moment. The pedagogical stance is there as well. And I want to just draw on that a little bit because I've looked at the philosophical um, reference. Um, the pedagogical affordances of Moodle, what I mean by pedagogy and pedagogical is, is you know, what happens during learning and teaching? What approaches are used? So it's, it's like an art, a craft almost. How do we, how do we craft uh, the how do we impart knowledge for understanding, I, I, I guess. So the pedagogical affordances of Moodle then identified as two key approaches informed by those philosophical reference are social constructionist approach and a social constructivist approach. And it's really important that you notice the approach there because that's the application and how those philosophical reference and the pedagogical kind of how, how it's translated into practice. There are two approaches. Um, so according to the Moodle docs, these approaches can be viewed as the bridging devices to facilitate the flexible environment in order to meet the learning needs of the individual and vice versa. As teachers, we learn from our students all the time. Okay, I want to turn now to the research design uh, for our project. Um, and that enabled us to examine the main research question, um, given the evident gap in the research and literature. So our main research question then uh, focused on pedagogy and learning opportunities that were manifest in the Teaching with Moodle MOOC. To use the analogy of a rainbow then, I want to talk to you now about um, the different layers or the different arcs, if you like, in terms of process across our research. And the first arch, then the red arch, as the researchers, we needed to identify our own positioning in the research. We were absolutely in the thick of, of, of it as course participants. And um, there's a new fandangle word around now, which I like very much. Um, we were part of... Um, Netnography, so we were uh, in the thick of it at the center of the action, and this afforded a cultural entree to what was going on. The second art, then the orange art, this led us to adopt an interpretive paradigm. We considered it as a relativist ontology on two levels. Uh, for course participants of so different ways of seeing and doing and their interpretations and our interpretations, but also a relativist ontology, ontology in terms of us as researchers. You know, Claire and I are both going to see things very differently and in, have different interpretations. I'm very open to that. Case study. 
I want to talk a bit about the case study, but before I do, um, I want to go back on, on, on that slightly in terms of subjectivity. Um, an interpretive paradigm, we accepted an inability to hold unadulterated views due to our experiences and mediations with the course. So we didn't set out to exorcise or, or try to, to hide our subjectivity. Instead, we attempted to manage it with the use of a case study and the different data sets we um, use. So the yellow arch then. Um, what did we decide to look at across such an enormous course with so many variables? The case study unit for analysis fitted the purpose, which was to focus on the main research question about pedagogy and learning opportunities um, in the MOOC. And this acted as our boundary. You know, we could have focused on many other things. That is why we needed to bound case. The fourth arch, the green arch then. Data collection. Mm. Four data sets um, were uh, decided upon for the case, essentially to improve internal validity. So what was I mean by that? that is that we needed to consider several ways of experience, meaning making, to enable a degree of objectivity. Participant views were gauged by access and reflective accounts from a focus group, and, and those participants were from Canada, Portugal, the UK, and the USA, and we looked at blogs and email correspondence and so on, so we very much foregrounded participant voice. In addition, we analysed sandbox courses across the MOOC, um, actually the sandbox courses in as much as those the focus group participants um, participated within. <clears throat> we also looked at related and wider literature and the Moodle documentation uh, for corroboration purposes. The blue arch then, the fifth arch, we had to think about how, what we were going to do with this data. You know, uh, oh, somebody, somebody's asking me to repeat what I just said. So I'm going to go back and do that the data collection. We collected four data sets for the case study, essentially to improve internal validity. And what I mean by that is that we needed to look at several ways of experience, several ways of experience and meaning making to enable a degree of objectivity. So participant views were gauged and we looked at their accounts from the course, what they had to say, and that was uh, via blogs and email correspondence as well. Additionally, we analysed um, sandbox courses within the MOOC related and wider literature, as well as the Moodle documentation. Okay, I'm going to move on to how we handled that data um, in terms of analysis. Given our constructivist methodology then, in that we attempted to manage our own subjectivity to construct knowledge from those data sets, we also undertook a constructivist analytical approach known as constructivist grounded theory, which afforded an inductive process of open coding. What I mean by inductive is that you go in to the codes, you look at what people have said or your data, and you interpret what's going on in that data. So you're not looking for anything specific, you're just interpreting what's going on. A deductive process then would entail finding uh, participant number one said that they very much like the forums, so you'd code that as number one, and then participant um, 86 also said they liked the forum, so you'd code that as number two, so you're deductively working with the data. But I first, well, I, myself and Claire, we worked inductively first just to see what was going on. So it's a constant cross-checking in detail of what is out there. Um, anyway, external validity was sought with member checks. They're so important. Whatever we came up with at the end of the day, we emailed back to those participants in the focus group to check the outcomes uh, for accuracy. And we also checked for accuracy across the research team. So that's 
the external validity. Okay, well, thank you for staying with me thus far. I'm going to move on now. Um, this is the analysis framework that we used, um, constructivist grounded theory. Um, this is something that uh, has now been published in a, uh, with other work. Um, and this is the indigo arch on our rainbow. What did the process involve? Well, I'll talk you through it. Open coding um, data sets to examine what was going on in the data with the aid of constant comparison and memory activity. So go backwards and forwards to see what uh, patterns were emerging. So that was our open coding stage. Axial coding includes identifying saturated categories. So you're going to have chunks of data uh, in one area or surrounding one area. And, you'll con and what we did was we constantly compa compared the other data uh, groupings, if you like, to see if we could slide across codes uh, to make saturated categories. And our memo, our little um, notes about those categories helped that process. If you can learn to selective code in stage three, so it's a three-stage process, this, um, we organize the themes and the memo activity. So essentially, we engaged with the data with the aim of seeking a shared meaning validated by member checks. <coughs> Findings, then. Um, this is the violet arch, the final arch of our research design and process. Um, the data were organized using a two-layered approach. First, the focus group led by the research question. Uh, what were participants' reflections on the teaching with Mood and MOOC? Uh, as you can see, this layer yielded 143 open codes six categories and two themes, uh, effective pedagogy and an enabling environment. And these were informed by three sub-themes. And there's some examples from the data uh, to support those themes. And um, I won't read them. Uh, I hope you take enjoyment in in reading them yourself. Okay, as you can see, the representative examples from this layer of analysis then suggest facilitators of the MOOC utilize resources and activities that appear to have a positive impact for learning. Participants felt a social connection with the facilitators and others. And we can also see the Dewey stance uh, in the examples, learning by doing, taking action in parallel with reassurance that support was on hand if need be. Uh, participants recognized a broad range of abilities across the cohort and appeared to be motivated to engage by this. Layer two, the practice course analysis. Um, in view of the Moodle documentation and wider or, or related literature. Uh, for the second layer of analysis, we focused on the main research question. An iterative approach enabled us to analyze the sandbox courses, which evidenced the focus group's engagement, and there were 22 of those in total. We had 513 open codes across 22 uh, practice courses, 22 categories, and two themes. And those two themes supported um, a dialogic pedagogy, modes for expression, modes for learning and teaching activity. Now, what I mean by expression is communication, obviously, the different types enabled within the MOOC, and the different types of uh, ways learning and teaching uh, activity was enacted, or 
were enacted. <clears throat> and the three sub themes uh, are dialogical instruction, dialogical inquiry, features of assessments. I'm just picking up a message here. It would be interesting to study. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Exciting times. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, OK, I'm going to move on to the next slide. I want to unpick some of the um, language I've used in that previous slide um, to keep you awake, at least. OK. In a return to the literature, having done all that analysis, there appeared to be very little research about pedagogy for practice in MOOCs. Instead, it remains highly theoretical with lack of application. For example, with all due respect, connectivism cannot be pinned down and it's not meant to be. And I get that. That's fair enough. However, a need to nurture dialogue for critical learning on an open network was apparent. And um, that's by a lady who t undertook research here, Rita Kopp. In her research, um, sh she discovered that from the outcomes that critical learning on an open network requires a place where dialogue happens. Now, keeping close to that research and literature, our findings build on that, and I want to unpick the concepts for with you now. Mm -mm. As you can see, dialogue can be defined in simple terms. Um, Robin Alexander in the UK uh, refers to it as conversation and inquiry. And the whole notion of dialogic then um, stems from Mikhail Bakhtin. Uh, and essentially, in simple terms, it involves difference um, to underpin communication. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, this is in contrast with um, Hagel's um, classic mantra, you know, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So I say something, you say something, we meet somewhere in the middle, uh, we've synthesized our ideas, and we all move on, and everything is, is pleasant and, and happy. But Bakhtin didn't didn't uh, suggest that happened during teaching and learning or during communication even. He said that we're always, uh, we always have an ongoing dialogue where difference um, exists and will always exist. Okay, so research findings then, are these research findings suggest an evident dialogical pedagogy. Um, due to the modes for expression, that uh, were uh, apparent in the results, um, such as Moodle activities and tools and the way they were used to enable dialogue. And this accords with wider literature, uh, dialogical instruction, um, with Nystrand's work a long time ago, where he suggested students' ideas, authentic questions, a space for dialogue, and where students can modify outcomes and goals. Um, all make up this, this notion of a dialogical instruction. And modes for teaching and learning activity, well, uh, apart, you know, after the analysis, it was very clear um, uh, that saturated categories that uh, instructors across the MOOC were uh, drawing upon independent, group, collaborative, and communal activity. And they're very different things, although you can get group work within collaborative activity and so on, but they're very different. OK, so dialogical inquiry then. Uh, Gordon Wells, um, oh, very well known across the education sector, uh, again a very long time ago stated, learning with others. Um, facilitators and peers together, aided by self-directed and self-regulated inquiry, is dialogical inquiry. So I've mapped the wider literature to what the outcomes were within the research. Finally, the 
features of assessment were student-led attainment and or achievement was apparent and I want to unpick those two concepts very quickly. Attainment is something that we do or learn within our own comfort zone. We mark out our, uh, sorry, achievement, sorry. Achievement are little steps that we achieve along the way during our learning adventures, if you like. But attainment is different. That's what the exam grade is. Um, that's the outcome, um, the rubrics or the curriculum benchmarks and so on. So attainment is something that's measured. Achievement is something that uh, can be quite um, useful to ourselves. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on. Okay, so corresponding links across the themes then. Um, in drawing the two layers of analysis together, I hope you can see how the themes and sub-themes are connected here. Next, I shall show you representative examples from the data analysis as to how those connections are made from the analysis outcomes. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of time there to look at the comparisons. There's the focus group data on the left and the practice course in little docs and literature um, on the right. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So let me unpick modes for expression uh, uh, evidence, uh, evidenced in the practice courses. The practice courses facilitated ideas and authentic questions, uh, for example, uh, across the learning forums for sharing experiences and professional contexts. And there's an example uh, reference from the analysis, meaning I can go back and see the whole range of analysis that makes up that um, outcome. Professional development then, the focus group, the corroborations. Well, one of the participants, you know, this is great. I, I will admit that the number of forum discussion posts asking for help or sharing of good ideas was overwhelming at times. One could have spent hours reading ideas shared or solutions to questions posed. So the forum really, really supported, um, you know, the, a, a great mode uh, for people to communicate about their professional contexts, um, asking for help, sharing good ideas, and so on. Okay, the message, comments, and social media blocks in Moodle enabled feedback and interaction across the community. Social media tools to share detail about upcoming events and the, uh, the social media tools were participatory. <coughs> Professional development, the focus group collaborations, where well, you can read that quote for yourself. And there are the links to the Moodle docs which were drawn upon to substantiate our findings. Okay, let's move on to a dialogical instruction then. <clears throat> now remember we spoke about Nystrand and we spoke about Gordon Wells and what they've got in their literature and, and you know these are renowned researchers um, from the 90s and um, it was evidenced in this research for online teaching and learning that, that it was there. Surprise, surprise, but it was there. So within group activity, self-directed action was prompted by the practitioner with a stimulus activity in Moodle that supported contributions to group, show and tell, digital role, and across learning forums. So um, bear in mind that group activity there were more uh, modes of instruction, but we'll, we'll move on to those next. To use the focus group corroborations, well, I'll leave you to read that. Okay. Dialogical inquiry then, let's move on to that now. With regard to stimulating engagement, providing provocations, it was apparent in the courses that the quiz tool 
uh, appear to enable confidence building, breaking down barriers to learning due to the nature of design. Again, this was supported by the focus group analysis outcomes and the Moodle docs, which outlines the flexibility of the quiz feature. Indeed, the courses show discussions and activities were in reference to the quiz where opportunities existed for dialogical inquiry that involved an initial independent self-directed regulated activity, the quiz, to inform consolidation of knowledge in topic-related activity when learning with others. I want to turn next now to the uh, next theme, enabling environments. And within that are the modes for learning and teaching and assessment. So groups then. It was evident from the course analysis certain modes for learning and teaching existed, such as independent, group, collaborative and communal activity engagement in addition to opportunities for independent activities for, for group activity it was evident that the choice activity in Moodle was used across the courses to facilitate these modes for instruction and inquiry similarly this related to the assignment tool enabling a self-paced approach as you can see from the representative example quote in the focus group data here the Moodle docs support the intended purpose of this tool as being able to stimulate thought about a topic or gather research content. Communal and collaborative engagements or activity. This involves self-directed activity, but in terms of collaborative engagement, this meant contributing towards a shared outcome, whether in groups or on a communal scale, supported by evidence in the focus group analysis and the purpose of the database glossary and workshop features, as outlined in the Moodle docs. Um, okay, getting back to assessment features, there was an evident pattern in the analysis in terms of this theme in that structured courses had identifiable ILOs, intended learning outcomes, and rubrics that were constructively aligned. There were badges and certificates which were used for attainment. Remember what I said about attainment, uh, aiming for an intended outcome, as well as achievement in other courses. Again, supported here when triangulated with the focus group themes and the Moodle docs, as you can see in the representative examples. Okay. Um, this is the last slide. Um, thank you for staying with me. Um, three words then, although I'm going to use more than three words, I already have. Um, it's a joke. Findings, limitations and implications. Um, to reiterate then, the findings were triangulated across four data sets. An analysis of the focus group data, literature, the sandbox courses and the Moodle docs. It therefore is suggested from those findings that there was an evident dialogical pedagogy in the Moodle MOOC. A pedagogy that had the potential to enable space for dialogue, dialogical instruction and dialogical inquiry in this case study. The limitations, well there are two limitations which can be identified and I shall defend these in the context of the work. First, the sample size, um, we had a small focus group, um, six participants were involved, although breadth, a geographical breadth was achieved. Um, I defend it, the small number, that we were able to seek a lot of depth um, anyway and 22 courses were included. So, you know what, a larger sample may have yielded more codes, more themes. Although focus group participants and the participant researchers spanned five countries and the 22 courses stem from 13 countries, I'm going to rest on the fact that depth as opposed to breadth was the aim. There were outliers you get to be quick 
Thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, there were outliers in the data. You know, I'm not going to hide that fact. There was there were codes that couldn't be coded. Um, and these yielded an emerging sense of user past experience um, could impact uh, on outcomes during online learning. Evaluations, I didn't consider the evaluations of the course I could have done. And it was evident in the focus group data um, a request for a longer course because four weeks was considered too short. So that was a code, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't, um, there weren't many of those uh, surrounding that, that coding. Secondly, case study and transference. And I really need to highlight this to do justice to my study, our study. Uh, case study is a spotlight on one instance. It's context bound and in some respects unique. It is also a single example of a broader class of things. Hence, there is no generalizability intended from this study's findings for other MOOCs than do not than those who uh, that for other MOOCs that do not use Moodle. This study then has limitations in terms of how the findings should be generalized to other MOOCs of that nature. To conclude the implications, well, I want to return back to the rationale for this study. For example, the dropout rates, the high enrollment paradox for MOOCs in light of the recent research undertaken by the Open University that examines social presence. The implications of that research suggest we focus on social presence for pedagogical enhancement. Social presence meaning learners need to feel in touch with each other to nurture a dynamic sense of others and relationships with them in mediated environments rather than something that can be easily conveyed by a static personal profile. Therefore, let's leave further research that adopts a dialogical pedagogy with Moodle tools for MOOCs might have wider implications for pedagogical enhancement and lower levels of attrition. Thank you for listening. Okay, there are some um, questions. I'm not sure. What would you like me to do, Nelly? Okay, um, there's a little bit of confusion about LMSs, but that's been cleared up now. Does anybody have any questions? Hmm. I stumbled across um, an email at work um, that said that there was this MOOC taking place. It was the first time I'd heard of a MOOC. And um, I thought, OK, I'll, I'll dip into it. Um, I can't commit to it because I, I had on this pile of marking to do for, for postgraduate students at the time. Um, but I dipped into it and I kind of had a had an image about it because at uh, the time I was studying for my doctoral, um, writing up my doctoral thesis um, and uh, my, my studies for that spanned five years with the Open University and a lot of that work was online learning and teaching. So um, no, I wasn't familiar with Moodle before um, I undertook the MOOC. Um, I used a different LMS <laughs> then, um, and a different one before that. Um, but no, I enjoyed myself. It was great. I loved the resources, the activities, the way things worked. And so I thought, well, let's do some research on this. What's going on? <laughs> Somebody's asking about um, a paper. Um, sorry, should I stop? Should I 
Mitchell. The paper's in press at the um, so what that basically means is the paper's written and it's gone off to a journal um, in the UK for peer review. Um, once the peer review process is finished, um, it will be published. Um, so it's it's time to wait, really. <laughs> Um, just a little while. Well, um, we met on the MOOC because Claire um, designed a course, so I participated in her sandbox course, and I just sent an email out asking if ever anybody was interested in. Um, taking part in uh, some research or, or conducting research, and, and that's how it happened. We met on the MOOC actually, and we have the same set. <laughs> no, we've not. We've never met actually. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I don't know. It's something I'd have to think about a bit more. Really, are you talking about kind of developing social relations? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Um, Absolutely agree, yes. I, I've used, like I said, I've used a couple of uh, learning management systems and um, of course the open source, the nature of Moodle, um, the community aspect, it's very different and does lend itself to um, possibilities for uh, professional collaboration. But yes, of course. I agree. Um, well, on that note, um, before I sign off, um, I'll keep in touch with you, Nelly, and send you the link for the paper as soon as I get it.